Greetings, Lizette. I haven't let in yet. Let me know or let them in. Um, also, just to note, I know I said this, but I think a couple more people have added. Um, be really cognizant of your audio being on if you're not presenting. Um, you have control of your microphone, so just please make sure you're muted if you're not speaking to reduce the feedback. Oh, good. We have our first four speakers. Um, Jijun, can you tell me how you actually pronounce your name? I probably just made it not good. Um, it's Jingjun. Jingjun. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to test if you can share your your screen? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, to the moderators as well, if we get speakers joining late, Does you can. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, we can see. Okay. okay. Cool. If you have speakers joining late, you should be able to rename them so you can add the number in front if you don't have the ability to just mention it to them. Are we waiting for many more people? Do you want to give it a couple of minutes before starting the session? Let me just make my way through the list and see. I think we just have two people that aren't here yet. All right, let's just go ahead and let people in then to keep it on, on time. Okay, so I'm just gonna pop myself on mute and turn my video off, but you can send me a chat if there's anything that pop, pops up during the session. Um, with those late speakers, just send me a message and I'll give them co-host privileges as soon as they arrive. All right, it looks like everyone who is in the waiting room has made their way in. So in the interest of time, let's go ahead and get uh, today's session started. So welcome to uh, today's locomotion session. I'm Jessica Allen, and I'll be moderating this session along with Dr. Becky Krupenovich from the University of North Carolina and James Tracy from the University of Delaware. Um, you'll be hearing from each of them later because we're gonna be splitting up moderating duties throughout the session. Before we begin, just a quick reminder about the session format. It's going to consist of 12 talks uh, that will be broken up into three different blocks. Within each block, we'll have four quick five minute talks that will go one after the other. And then after those talks, we'll have approximately 10 minutes of questions for those uh, four speakers within the block. Um, we will be using the chat functionality for questions. So during the talks and after the talks, go ahead and post your question in the chat for each speaker. Uh, please do make sure to denote which speaker your question is for so that we ask the right question to the right person. Uh, in all likelihood, we probably won't get, be able to get through all of our chat questions um, during this uh, session today. So we do invite you to participate in any continued discussions of these presentations after our session in one of the spatial chat rooms. Um, we'll post a link for this and remind you about it at the end of our session. Um, with that, but without further ado, let's go ahead and get to our first talk which will be from Nicole Stark, who's at Virginia Tech, and she'll be leading us off by talking to us about gait asymmetry in healthy young adults. Uh, so Nicole, go ahead and take us away. We can all see the screen, right? I can't see you all. So. You guys are good. Yep, you're good. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I can't lost y'all when I shared screens. So hi, my name is Nicole Stark, and I'm a PhD student at Virginia Tech in the Granada Biomechanics Lab. And today I'll be presenting our work on determining the impact of age on gait symmetry. Historically, bilateral symmetry in gait has been assumed, though previous reviews have illustrated the importance of evaluating gait bilaterally. 
arguing that gait symmetry is normal because of limb dominance and independent limb coordination. Recent publications have provided variable results when examining gait symmetry in healthy individuals, and it is unknown how age affects symmetry. This makes it hard to establish rehabilitation benchmarks for the restoration of symmetry in injured and pathological populations that many clinicians strive for. Therefore, the purpose of this study was to determine the impact of age on gait symmetry. Symmetry in the study was defined as the difference in kinematics and sagittal plane kinetics between the right and left limb. 82 healthy adults ages 18 to 85 signed an IRB approved informed consent form before study participation. Healthy was operationally defined as having no history of serious lower extremity injuries or lower extremity surgeries, no lower extremity injury in the past 12 months, and the ability to walk unassisted for 10 minutes. A modified Helen Hayes marker set was applied to each participant and motion capture data with force plate data was used to capture joint kinematics and kinetics. We had each participant then complete four to seven walking trials at a self-selected walking speed. Participants were then split into three age groups based on previous literature for analysis. These age groups in the previous literature were determined based upon maximal gait speed differential, looking at the different ages and cutoffs. We first evaluated each age group for walking speed, as walking speed is known from the literature to decline with age. However, we did not find a significant difference in walking speed uh, for this cohort, which indicates that we had some pretty fit older adults. Seven joint kinematic and kinetic variables were evaluated for gait symmetry using the normalized symmetry index, also known as MSI, in the equations on the slide. The normalized symmetry index ranges between negative 100 to 100, where zero indicates full symmetry and 100 indicates full asymmetry. The NSI equation was adapted to look at non-dominant and dominant limbs, where limb dominance was defined by which leg was used to kick a soccer ball. For our results, a three-way ANOVA was performed to compare each symmetry variable across age groups with a post hoc scam tiles test for significantly different measures. A significant difference was found in two measures. However, there was no difference found in the other five measures. When comparing across age groups, only propulsion ground reaction force and ankle plantar flexion ground reaction force showed a significant difference. The post hoc analysis showed that there was a significant difference between the first and second age groups for propulsion ground reaction force and ankle plantar flexion. However, between the second and third age groups, there was only a significant difference in propulsion ground reaction force. We would also like to note that hip range of motion, weight acceptance ground reaction force, and propulsion ground reaction force all had mean symmetry values of under 5%, while peak knee flexion and sagittal plane knee range of motion were under 10%. This data suggests that the commonly used value for healthy functional task symmetry of under 10% may be appropriate for many variables across, the, across a wide range of healthy adults. The older adults in this cohort maintained gait speeds comparable to those of the youngest in the group. Therefore, these findings might not apply to all older adults. Our findings of large asymmetry for healthy peak hip extension and peak ankle plantar flexion indicate that an overall symmetry cutoff of 10% may not be used for er every variable and should be, that cutoff should be variable specific, which is also agrees with previous literature. Future studies should assess symmetry in an older adult cohort that may not be as fit and that may demonstrate a typical walking speed decline with age. This study was limited as it did not evaluate individuals as they age, but instead evaluated them in a cohort model in which individuals were grouped by age and then compared. These findings also indicate the need for a longitudinal study of gait symmetry during the aging process, as well as detailed tracking of injury and disease history to determine the impact of injury and disease on gait symmetry. Thank you for attending, and I'm looking forward to discussing this study and answering any questions. Thanks, Nicole. That was um, very interesting, and I look forward to seeing what questions uh, we have after the, um, this block. Um, we're going to stay on somewhat of the topic of asymmetry, but now move towards uh, hip kinematics um, and sex differences in asymmetry with our speaker, Camille. Camille Johnson from the University of Pittsburgh. Okay, can everyone see and hear me okay? Yep. Okay, perfect, thank you. 
All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Camille Johnson and I'm a PhD student at the University of Pittsburgh. Today I'll be presenting on healthy hip kinematics during gait, um, sex differences and asymmetry revealed through dynamic biplane radiography. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the contributions of my co-authors. Sorry, my PowerPoint seems to have frozen. Oh, here we go. These are disclosures. The contralateral hip frequently serves as a reference for clinical evaluation of a variety of hip pathologies, including osteoarthritis, femoroacetabular impingement, and hip dysplasia. It is difficult to accurately evaluate kinematic symmetry using conventional skin-mounted motion capture due to large errors in rotation and translation when compared to biplane radiography, and there's a lack of quantitative data regarding hip kinematics that is not affected by soft tissue artifacts. Additionally, there is a lack of data describing side-to-side -side differences, or SSD, in hip kinematics in healthy adults, which is an important step in understanding the interrelationship between morphology, kinematics, and pathology, as well as providing context for assessing the restoration of hip kinematics after injury, surgery, or rehabilitation. Therefore, the aim of this study was to determine side-to-side -side differences in healthy hip kinematics during gait. The secondary aim was to identify any secondary sex-based differences in kinematics or symmetry. 22 healthy young adults consented to participate in this IRB-approved study, and synchronized biplane radiographs were collected at 50 images per second for one second during treadmill walking at a self-selected speed with three trials collected per hip. Femur and pelvis tissue were segmented from CT scans to create 3D subject-specific bone models. And anatomic coordinate systems were established in each femur and hemipelvis, mirrored to the contralateral side, and co registered to produce identical coordinate systems for each hip. Femur and pelvis resolution, femur and pelvis position, excuse me, were determined by matching the digitally reconstructed radiographs created from the volumetric CT bone models to each frame of the biplane radiographs using a validated volumetric model based tracking technique. Six degree of freedom rotations and translations were calculated, filtered, and normalized to static standing posture. Translations were calculated as displacement of the femoral head center from the acetabulum center along the pelvic anatomical axes. Sex differences in kinematic curves were identified using statistical parametric mapping unpaired t-tests. Since data capture was primarily focused on the stance phase of gait, this analysis was constrained to late swing through stance phase. The dotted horizontal line represents neutral standing position, and the vertical lines represent foot strike and push off. Our only significant sex based difference in kinematics was that women were significantly more adducted than men during 7 to 31 percent gait cycle. Symmetry was determined by calculating the average absolute side to side difference in kinematic waveforms for each participant, and sex differences in side to side difference were identified using two sample t tests. 19 participants were included in the analysis of side-to-side -side differences. Rotational side-to-side -side differences were 3.8 degrees for flexion extension, 4.6 for internal external rotation, and 2.8 degrees for abduction adduction. Translational side-to-side -side differences were all less than one millimeter, and no significant sex-based differences in average side-to-side -side difference were identified. The results of this study indicate that asymmetry of up to 4.6 degrees in rotation and 0.6 millimeters in translation is typical in healthy hips during gait and may not necessarily indicate underlying pathology. Additionally, our cohort suggests that women may exhibit more hip adduction during mid stance than men. Further research is necessary to determine if these differences are associated with sex based differences in hip morphology. Compared to previous biplane radiography studies of healthy volunteers, our results suggest that during walking, rotational asymmetry is greater at the hip than at the knee and ankle but translational asymmetry is typically less at, than at the knee and ankle. These differences may be due to bony constraints of the femoroacetabular joint, facilitating joint stability and weight bearing. Overall, the side-to-side -side differences and sex-based kinematic differences observed in this healthy asymptomatic cohort may serve as a reference when evaluating motion in individuals with pathology or undergoing rehabilitation. Thank you for your time, and I'll take any questions at the end of this block. Thanks, Camille. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker, which is um, Wyatt Immelt from the Center for Limb Loss and Mobility at VA Puget Sound and the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. We can see you, but we can't hear you, so you might be muted. 
There we go. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you guys for that introduction. The following are my disclosures as well as our funding source at the bottom of the slide there. So to give a little bit of background, uh, following amputation, individuals with limb loss typically display a significant reduction in muscular strength. If you look at the data on the left of your screen, uh, in particular, individuals with unilateral transtibial amputation have been shown to exhibit approximately 40% less knee flexion and extension strength in their residual limb when compared to their sound limb. Um, and this strength asymmetry we believe uh, is important and may contribute to performance impairments we typically see during ambulation in this population. One of the ways this has been shown is if you look at the study on the right from 2018, is through predictive optimization techniques um, where they showed uh, using musculoskeletal modeling that strength loss of as little as 10% in the residual limb can increase uh, metabolic cost of walking from pre to post amputation. Specifically, they found that the knee flexion and extension musculature being the largest contributors to this functional deficit. Um, that brings us to the purpose of our study, which was to see um, how this carries over into human subjects to see how does knee strike asymmetry affect walking objects across um, a variety of speeds. So we had 11 individuals with unilateral traumatic transtibial amputation that underwent strength testing with us for peak isokinetic knee flexion and extension strength. Um, because we we're unable to obtain any pre-amputation strength values, uh, we utilized their sound limb as a reference uh, to what their residual limb strength might have been pre-amputation and calculated an asymmetry index. Uh, we then compared that value to walking economy, so metabolic cost and heart rate, as well as patient reported um, or participant reported ratings of perceived exertion using a Borg scale across three different gait speeds, so a slow, moderate, and fast walking speed. Looking at our findings, so I plotted metabolic cost on the y-axis and asymmetry index on the x-axis. Um, so the greater you go on the x-axis, the greater asymmetry that individual displayed. Um, and what we found was greater knee extension strength asymmetry was significantly associated with an increase in metabolic cost um, at that faster walking speed, so the blue circles. Um, however, when looking at knee flexion strength asymmetry, we did not find that significant association between metabolic cost and any of our walking speeds. Um, so these findings may indicate that weaker relative residual limb knee extension strength may disallow the individual with the transitive amputation the ability to really efficiently load that limb, and as a result, they elicit a greater metabolic cost. And this is kind of echoed when we look at our heart rate data as well. So I replaced uh, metabolic cost with heart rate on the y-axis, and we found a similar trend. So we found that that greater knee extension strength asymmetry was also significantly associated with an increase in heart rate, again, at that faster walking speed, with knee flexion strength asymmetry not significantly associated uh, with uh, heart rate at any walking speed. So these findings may also indicate that deficits related to knee strength asymmetry are generally more evident during a more difficult task, such as a faster than normal walking speed, where with residual limb uh, strength loss, the task of minimizing any gait deviations with the amputation that become, or it may become increasingly difficult with each increase in speed and thus requires a greater metabolic cost. Finally, observing our RPE values, uh, while knee flexion strength asymmetry was not significantly associated with any of our walking energetic metrics, we did find uh, knee flexion strength asymmetry index to be significantly associated uh, with an increase in participants' perceived difficulty of the task, specifically at that slower and moderate walking speed. Um, so therefore, while lower knee flexion strength asymmetry may not display a direct and significant metabolic benefit, uh, it may help individuals with unilateral transtibial amputation um, with their overall knee joint stability during gait and thus execute gait with uh, less perceived difficulty. So in conclusion, uh, these findings highlight the importance of retaining residual limb knee flexion and extension strength. By maintaining or even improving knee flexion and extension strength in that residual limb in particular, it may help mitigate some negative functional and perceptual outcomes that we typically see in this population. Um, evaluating knee strength may be important clinically as well, more so than the typical uh, manual muscle testing um, used by clinicians and may actually further assist clinicians in tracking overall progress during rehabilitation. And finally, uh, future research should look potentially at the impact of a strength training intervention um, to ultimately continue to explore how these strength metrics affect the long-term fu functional performance of individuals who've experienced transtibial amputation. Thank you very much. If you're interested in this line of research, uh, be sure to check out Ross Moe's presentation Thursday morning. He goes more into the modeling side of this. All right, thanks, Wyatt. 
We'll move on to our fourth and final talk within this block. Mm -hmm. It'll be from Jingjun Liu at the University of Wisconsin-Madison talking to us about real-time gate prediction. So, I think, I think my screen is shared and hopefully the microphone works well. Cool, so I got started. Hi everyone, I'm Jing Jing from Mechanical Engineering Department of University of Wisconsin-Madison. And my presentation topic today is real-time Gantt prediction with two sensors for semi-active prosthesis control. So for some motivations of this study, the human lower limb behaves differently under various type of ground conditions, namely level ground, stairs, and ramp motions. It is vital for a prosthesis to adjust accordingly for the best performance. For semi-active prosthesis, an early prediction of Gantt mode is important because the device can pre-adapt to the impending stance phase. Such adaptations include changes in stiffness, etc. And there has already been many studies on Gantt mode classification, but in our study, the goal was to have a decent prediction of Gantt mode in the first half of a step so that there can be room to make adaptations. Also, we wanted to use as few sensors as possible. We ended up using two sensors on shank and foot. Machine learning is a proper tool for real-time prediction. When collecting data after the, under the IRB approval, the subjects wore a suit from XSense and VN Biomatch with sensors on shank and feet. The system recorded movement data at 60 to 100 hertz, and disputing Gantt reconstruction was used to convert the row data into attitude heading reference system. To make our feature vectors, we excluded the yaw information since working direction is not of our interest. After many tests, we decided to make separate data sets for each direction of both sensors. And one line of data contains information from 10 consecutive samples in the first half of a step. This gave us six data sets and the dimension of each data set is 50. So support vector machine algorithm were used to train the model. Some kernel functions were applied to get a higher prediction accuracy. Five-fold cross-validation is used to test the reliability of the model. As you can see in the table, the self-validated accuracy are all over 85%. Since all of the six classifiers will be used in making the final prediction, this accuracy is basically sufficient for that. So here comes the final result. We test the predictor on a different trial from the same subject. The x-axis is the steps of the subject and the y-axis is the Gantt mode. The green dots are correct predictions, the red crosses are wrong predictions and the blue circles are the real motion type for wrongly predicted steps. As you can see in the picture, the prediction for each single step is uh, overall accurate, but for transition steps, the accuracy is 87.5%. Since the adaptations of the prosthesis should be made in the transition steps, it is more meaningful to look at the later number here. So for the conclusion part, the result demonstrates that a reliable prediction of Gantt mode can be generated in real time while the person is walking. With this information, the prosthesis can adjust to the new locomotion automatically. Compared with other motion classification methods, it can have a valid result earlier in the first half of a swing phase. Also, only two sensors were used, which means it does not require a complicated sensing system. This technique could also be applied to any assistive devices that has periodic leg motions and needs to change configurations under different circumstances. However, it should also be noticed that the training set and test set come from a same subject and the prediction accuracy may be lower when applied on a different subject. Meanwhile, the sensor data is not raw. The built-in reconstruction tool from XSense has already made some pre-processing of the data. So this method may not work well on sensors taking raw data, like a generic IMU. If we work with those sensors, some processing in real time would be necessary. So thank you for your listening, and I'm willing to talk with you later. Thank you to all our presenters. Uh, we now have about seven minutes for some questions. So there's been some questions in the chat already. We'll start one for our first presenter, uh, for Nicole. This is from Maddie Major. Are you able to speak to the rather large error bands and symmetry of some kinematics? Are there any confounders that may relate to this observation? Yeah, so for that one, um, we see rather large error bands in our ankle plantar flexion measures as well as our hip extension measures. Um, so ankle plantar flexion is a relatively small measure. 
Um, and I think that part of this is due to um, the NSI equation was developed in order to work alongside of these um, smaller measures by creating a bounded measure. Um, however, with such small ranges we're seeing in the ankle plantar flexion, we could still be seeing some of those compounding effects in the calculation. Um, also with that, there is um, the larger error bars for the, the, those measures are seen in the first age group, which is our like 18 to 20 year old, like 30 year olds. And then our last age group is our 50 to 80 year olds. Um, and this could also play into a role of how they propel their gait um, and what is powering their gait. So we know in literature that gait is powered either as you age, gait is powered more through the hip and less through the ankle versus in our younger adults, it's powered more through the ankle. So this could be playing a role and we're planning to look at and evaluate that in future studies. Thank you. I know we have another question for our second presenter for Camille. Um, so this question is, what were the ages in your participants, particularly the women? And do you think there would be any reason to stratify or expect any differences dependent on gynecological history, um, such as past pregnancy and or childbirth? Yes, so um, our, all our participant ages were between 18 and 26. And I know the overall average um, age was 21 years old. Um, I'm not sure about the ages for the women off the top of my head. Um, but I definitely think that would be an interesting metric to uh, analyze. As far as I know, we don't collect that in any of our demographics, but it'd be interesting to see if we had a participant who had experienced uh, multiple pregnancies or single pregnancy, single childbirth, how that affected their gait and pelvis orientation. So I definitely think that would be an interesting way to analyze. All right, thank you. Um, and we have another question for you. I think we'll, we'll come back. We'll have another question here for Wyatt. Um, how long after amputation were these participants? And how do you think compensation of the sound limb may differ from what the strength uh, of their amputated limb? Um, we did not collect time from amputation, unfortunately. Um, we do, I would say on average, they were anywhere from five to almost 20 years. Um, we had a pretty good mix of younger, more active participants to older, um, less active participants. Um, can you repeat the second part of that question again? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think the compensation of the sound limb may differ from um, the strength of their amputated limb? Um, in terms of what I visually saw with them, um, most of them definitely used a pretty heavily uh, sound limb compensation during gait. Uh, we did, I didn't present the results here, their sound limb was significantly greater um, strength-wise across the board for um, knee extension and knee flexion. Um, yeah, I, I would say, I guess, definitely a heavy compensation on the sound limb um, during gait. And for our, our last speaker here, uh, Jin Jun, uh, what other assistive devices could this technique be applied to? So as far as I can think about maybe a prosthetic leg or some uh, semi-active prosthesis of um, as a part of the uh, leg or hip joint, uh, anything that can should change their working mode under different circumstances should be apply, applicable to this method. Thank you, so we have just a couple more minutes. So I'll come back to some more questions here. Uh, Camille, uh, this is from Dr. Allen. So you found that women exhibit more hip adduction. Uh, can you speculate on why this might be? Uh, perhaps more morphology or strength or neural strategies? Yes, um, so I would um, think it was probably morphologically related. So as a secondary analysis, we had our orthopedic surgeon uh, screen these asymptomatic people for um, pathologies. So whether they had dysplasia or evidence of FAI, and um, he found that most of the asymptomatic pathologies were in uh, male participants. So our next step is going to be to stratify our cohort by um, those morphological differences. So based on that, I would expect that's where that difference in adduction came from. All right, thank you. And Wyatt, we have a couple more questions for you here. 
Uh, was there a specific reason for the 30 degrees per second for the isokinetic measures? And, and have you considered uh, other speeds as well? Yeah, um, so the reason for the 30 degrees per second is this data set or this uh, project was primarily to collect data um, to validate our development of a musculoskeletal model for individuals with limb loss. Um, so we wanted maximal strength as much of the range of motion as possible. Um, I definitely think if I could continue to collect data, I would like to get it at some other speeds. And I think that might be a reason we're only seeing that significant association at the faster walking speed is we're really taking strength from a much higher or essentially their maximum strength. Um, and I would say the walking at the faster speed is more or less their fastest or their maximum walking speed. Um, so I think that's why we're kind of seeing that significant association only at that higher level of activity um, and maybe doing it at slower speeds or getting some sub-maximal strength values, you might start to see an association at that slower and moderate walking speed. All right, thank you. Uh, I think we'll stop here with questions, make sure we have time for our next block of speakers. Um, so I'll turn the time over to Becky now. Thanks, uh, we'll get started with our next block here. Um, our first speaker is Burju Idemir. Um, you want to go ahead and pull up your slides and the title of her talk is effects of lower limb joint powers and kinesiophobia on physical activity in people with knee osteoarthritis. Can everyone see the slides? Yes. All right. Um, hi, my name is Burju. I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and I'm just going to give a quick synopsis on our study, which looked at the effects of lower limb joint powers and kinesiophobia on physical activity in people with knee OA. Uh, so as we all know, physical activity is important overall for general health in all populations, but in individuals that have musculoskeletal diseases like OA, it can be important for maintaining function. Unfortunately, being inactive can lead to functional limitations such as loss of mobility. And walking is one activity that's an integral part of most activities of daily living. And we know that OA can impact biomechanical factors related to walking patterns. Another uh, psychological factors are also have been linked to activity limitations in NeoA. Kinesiophobia specifically, like many other phobias, involves a persistent fear that certain situations or activities um, might cause pain or disability. So the sufferer tends to avoid activities because they're afraid of not knowing whether it'll lead to pain. And a lot of these feelings are based on previous pain experiences. And this has been linked to activity limitations in people with osteoarthritis. So the aim of our study was we wanted to explore whether biomechanical and psychological factors collectively had an effect on physical activity in people with knee OA. We did this by collecting and analyzing peak generative or a propulsive joint powers at the ankle, knee, and hip during walking. Um, all of our subjects walked on a split belt treadmill at a self-selected speed, and we assessed self-reported measures of kinesiophobia and physical activity level. So once we collect our data, we had 37 participants with knee OA um, and we conducted a regression analysis and we found that individuals that use more propulsive hip and ankle generation in late stance and those who also reported greater fear were less active. Um, after controlling for speed, however, only generative hip power and fear and a slower walking speed were related to lower activity levels. Um, when accounting for all of these measures, peak knee power was not a significant predictor in any of our models. So what does this kind of tell us? Well, overall, our findings emphasize the importance of considering psychological factors such as kinesiophobia when looking at physical activity as an outcome measure, especially with biomechanical measures, given that fear of physical movement could perhaps affect actual movement patterns if individuals are intentionally or non-intentionally trying to protect themselves. And this could ultimately contribute to activity avoidance behaviors or inactivity. Um, additionally, we also observed that the hip might be compensating for distal joints. And over time, this could possibly contribute, or contribute to quicker fatigue, making activities of daily living challenging, which could it help explain why maybe everyone's reporting reduced activity levels in the sample that we analyzed. And thank you very much. 
Thank you, Virgil. Um, our next speaker is Steven Garcia, and he will be, pre be presenting alterations in knee quasi stiffness during early and mid stance after ACL reconstruction. Thank you for the introduction. Let me just let me share my slides. All right. So we know that after ACL reconstruction, gait abnormalities are common, and we commonly see reductions in sagittal plane moments as well as flexion angles. Um, and generally refer to this strategy as kind of stiffen knee gait strategy. Um, this has been commonly observed in OA populations as individuals with OA walk with increased knee stiffness compared to controls. Um, and knee stiffness has been shown to increase with OA severity as well. Um, this has been um, commonly quantified by evaluating the change in joint moment relative to the change in joint angle. angle. And this is referred to as knee quasi stiffness or dynamic joint stiffness. Some recent research has suggested that increases in knee joint stiffness or quasi stiffness is predictive of patellofemoral OA progression. Um, so this may be an important metric to evaluate in people in other populations who are at risk for OA, such as those with ACL reconstruction. Um, however, to date, I'm not entirely sure if individuals with ACL reconstruction do exhibit alternate knee quasi stiffness. Uh, so the purpose of our study was we want to evaluate. Are there differences between limbs in knee quasi stiffness in individuals with ACL reconstruction? And our second aim was to kind of evaluate the individual components of this metric to kind of see where um, perhaps some of these may be driven from. So we evaluated three gait biomechanics at a self selected pace. Uh, in 26 individuals with ACL reconstruction, our main outcome of interest was sagittal plane knee joint stiffness. Um, this was evaluated in both early stance and in mid stance. Uh, for early stance, this was evaluated between the initial flexion moment and the peak knee extension moment. Uh, for mid stance, this was evaluated between the peak knee extension moment and the minimum moment towards terminal stance. Our secondary outcomes of interest was the knee sagittal plane moments, so the peak moments of these two time points, as well as knee joint excursions, so flexion excursion, as well as knee extension excursion, as shown here. So our findings in early stance phase, we found that individuals with ACL reconstruction walk with about 18% greater knee stiffness in the ACL reconstructed limb relative to the uninvolved limb. Um, however, when looking at the individual components, we actually didn't see any differences in the peak knee extension moment in the involved relative to the uninvolved limb. However, there was a significant reduction in knee flexion excursion by about four degrees. So it seems at least in early stance phase, potentially this increase in knee quasi stiffness could be driven by this uh, truncated uh, knee flexion excursion in this phase. In mid stance phase, um, we found some consistent findings. So in the involved limb, they walked with about 25% greater knee stiffness in the ACL relative to the uninvolved limb. However, we saw differences in both the knee moments here as well as the knee extension excursions. So there seemed to be uh, kind of a sustained flexion in the ACL limb and potentially going through less limb unloading in this phase as well. So in conclusion, our data kind of lends support to that gait abnormalities after ACL construction are seemingly persistent. Um, and this was despite showing similar knee joint moments, at least in early stance phase in the ACL limb. Um, the increases in knee quasi stiffness that we observe could represent a reduced ability to dissipate knee loads, which could be hazardous for cartilage health and may contribute to these early changes in joint health that are occurring after ACL reconstruction. Um, and given that this metric has been related to patellofemoral OA progression in other cohorts, um, future work should evaluate how knee quasi stiffness is associated with some of these early degenerative changes that may be occurring after ACL reconstruction. So quickly, I wanted to thank our funding sources and my mentors and lab members, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions for this. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, our third speaker is Mark Pappas, um, and he is presenting a climatization of force production in individuals with Parkinson's disease. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So hi everyone, my name is Mark Pappas and I'm an undergrad at the University of Florida and I do research in the Applied Neuromechanics Lab. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the acclimatization of force production in individuals with Parkinson's disease, also known as BD. So what is PD? PD is a neurodegenerative disorder that primarily affects the movement and can directly impact the pace and rhythm of each step. 
Currently, there are more than 10 million individuals worldwide with Parkinson's disease, and similar to many other diseases, PD incidence increases with age, but there is still currently no known cause or cure for PD. Some of the current treatments for individuals with PD include pharmacological interventions, surgical interventions like deep brain stimulation, and physical therapy. And in previous research, treadmill walking has been utilized as both an assessment and rehab approach to evaluate and improve spatiotemporals. And while treadmill walking is an effective intervention, it's still unknown exactly how these individuals with PD change their walking pattern over a single uh, exposure to a treadmill. And the purpose of this study was to investigate the changes in spatiotemporals uh, and force production in individuals with Parkinson's disease. We hypothesized that increases in step length would be associated with increased in force production over the duration of the treadmill intervention. So for our data collections, 12 individuals with idiopathic Parkinson's disease completed five minutes of treadmill walking at their self-selected preferred speed. Uh, previous research in clinical populations has suggested that a 50 stride epic was adequate for comparison over a baseline treadmill session. And thus, we chose to investigate the changes during the first and last 50 strides of the five minute treadmill intervention. And then for statistics, we use pair T tests to compare the peak, uh, peak force propulsion, peak breaking force, stride time, stride length, and double stance time during the first and last 50 strides. So for our results, there were no significant differences identified between the first and last 50 strides for the magnitude of both peak propulsive and braking force. But interestingly, for the spatial temporals, there were significant differences for the magnitude of stride time, stride length, and double stance time. Specifically, these participants took longer, slower strides and spent more time in double stance during the last 50 strides. Also, there was no significant difference between any of our variability measures. And due to the significant differences between minute one and five for the magnitudes of stride length, stride time, and double stance time, all while at a constant belt speed, it's apparent that the changes in the peak ground reaction force may not be the underlying cause for the changes in our spatial temporals. And to our knowledge, this is the first study that is analyzing the changes in spatial temporals within the familiarization period or between minute one and five um, on a treadmill in individuals with PD. And ultimately, uh, in only five minutes, our participants' stride lengths move closer to their healthy uh, peers without any change in belt speed. So what does this all mean? Uh, one of our main findings was that we identified that peak ground reaction force is not a primary driver of our observed differences. And further investigation into the change in time dependent variables like impulse could help provide a deeper understanding of the changing gait mechanisms in individuals with Parkinson's disease. Also, determining the minimum amount of time needed for a significant difference in spatial temporals should be identified with further investigation. And this is currently all preliminary data. So any suggestions and questions are greatly appreciated. And then I just wanna take this chance to thank the Applied Neuromechanics Lab and the University of Florida University Scholars Program, as well as Sydney Bondistel for her help along my project. Thank you. Thank you. We've got one more talk in this block. Um, and that is Billy Clark. And the title of his presentation is Age-Related Changes to Tricep Surrey Muscle Subtendon Interaction Dynamics During Walking. Thanks for the introduction. So I recently joined Tom Roberts Lab at Brown University as a postdoc, but today I'll be presenting work for my PhD while working with Jason Franz at UNC and NC State. So one of the major factors influencing walking performance is the tricep surrey muscle Achilles tendon unit. So there are three muscles that make up the tricep surrey. You have the medial and lateral gastrocnemius and the soleus. And those three muscles transmit their force through three subtendons of the Achilles tendon. And together, these muscle subtendon units produce ankle moment, which is the largest contributor to forward propulsion. It's really important for regulating walking speed, and it's significantly reduced by aging. And in the past, using dynamic ultrasound imaging, we and others have shown that the gastrocnemius and soleus subtendon undergo different displacement patterns during walking. 
And these differences are commonly referred to as Achilles tendon tissue non-uniformity. So greater non-uniformity would mean greater differences between the subtenants. And these patterns are really interesting because tendon non-uniformity could facilitate different contractile behaviors between the gastrocnemius and soleus muscles, which is important because these muscles contribute differently to forward propulsion and vertical support during walking. Additionally, there is a potential translational implication to tendon non-uniformity. So in a previous study in our lab, the magnitude of tendon non-uniformity positively correlates with peak ankle moment during walking. And importantly, in older adults, we see a significant reduction in tendon non-uniformity. So together, these findings allude to a fundamental change in the interaction between muscle and tendon as a potential determinant for reduced push-off intensity in older adults. However, we lack a muscle level determinant for this reduction. So the big question is, what is happening at the muscle level when you have more uniform Achilles tendon tissue displacements? That really is the purpose of our study. Uh, we sought out to investigate a muscle level determinant for previously observed correlations between more uniform Achilles tendon tissue displacements and reduced push-off intensity in older adults. And we really had two main hypotheses. So first, we hypothesized that older adults would have more uniform Achilles tendon tissue displacements that would be accompanied by smaller differences between gastrocnemius and soleus muscle length change. And then second, we hypothesized that the magnitude of difference between gastrocnemius and soleus muscle length change would positively correlate with push-off intensity. So for our experimental design, subjects came in and they walked on an instrumented treadmill for one minute at 1.2 meters per second. And then again, at 1.2 meters per second with a 5% body weight aiding force condition designed to decrease the mechanical demand for forward propulsion and a 5% body weight impeding force condition designed to increase the mechanical demand for forward propulsion. And throughout, we simultaneously collected muscle and tendon ultrasound imaging, as well as inverse kinematics and dynamics. So on to our results. Uh, here first, I am showing young adults in black and old adults in gray with the magnitude of Achilles tendon non-uniformity on the bottom and then muscle level differences on top. And consistent with our first hypothesis, older adults had more uniform tendon tissue displacements and smaller differences in gastrocnemius versus soleus muscle length change compared to young adults. And importantly, in those young adults, the magnitude of Achilles tendon non-uniformity positively correlated with larger muscle level differences in length change across changes in horizontal force. But inter interestingly, these correlations were absent in older adults, and they were also accompanied by significant interaction effects suggesting that older adult muscle and tendon level behavior were significantly less sensitive to changes in mechanical demand. And perhaps in older adults, more uniform Achilles tendon tissue behavior is restricting independent triceps area muscle actuation, which may have functional consequences. So in young adults, the differences at the muscle level positively correlated with each measure of push-off intensity, peak ankle moment, peak ankle power, and positive push-off work during stance. However, we did not observe any significant positive correlations between muscle level behavior and push-off intensity in older adults. So one potential interpretation of our findings is that the capacity for sliding between adjacent subtenants may facilitate independent muscle actuation in young adults, but may restrict that actuation in older adults. And the resultant disruption in muscle contractile behavior likely contributes in part to hallmark reductions in push-off intensity during walking in older adults. I'd like to acknowledge our funding sources and collaborators in these projects. And if anyone is interested in chatting more about this research, what I've been up to at Brown or potential future opportunities, I've added my email address and a QR code to my research gate profile, or just reach out to me on spatial chat. But with that, I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thanks, Billy. So we, it looks like we have quite a bit of time for questions, which is wonderful because we have quite a bit of questions. Um, so I'm actually going to start with one of the ones that came in most recently because it's related to uh, uh, tangentially to two different talks. This is from uh, David Hollinger and it's to both Billy and Stephen. So maybe you guys can spend a brief minute each uh, providing your answers. Uh, but the question is uh, that Achilles tendon stiffness tends to decrease during aging due to altered elastic modulation and may alter toe off mechanics during walking. Do you think there is a possible link between the, increase, the changes or decreased Achilles stiffness 
um, and the increased knee quasi stiffness that um, Stephen found. I can talk about how Achilles tendon stiffness may have impacted our results, um, but I guess I'll point it to Stephen after that to talk about increased knee quasi stiffness. But uh, at least at, in our results, uh, we found significantly more displacement in the Achilles tendon of older adults, suggesting maybe increased tendon compliance in those older adults. And that could impact tendon non-uniformity um, because you could imagine um, if there is a difference in stiffness between the subtendons, then you could require more force to elicit that non-uniformity. Yeah, so at least within in regards to knee, knee quasi stiffness, um, it is possible that this could also be related to potentially some of the things that we're seeing. I think um, at least propulsive phase characteristics after ACL reconstruction are not as well defined in this population. Um, we know that there's a lot of changes going on in the knee um, and they could be compensating at other joints. So it's possible that at least with aging, if individuals, individuals who are older undergoing ACL reconstruction, that could be another factor that could be influencing, you know, knee mechanics or mechanics up the, up the chain a little bit. But um, I think this is something that's definitely requires some further study, at least in individuals with ACL reconstruction. Good question. And then to stay on the same topic before we move to um, a, a different presentation, um, both Paul DeVita and Luke Nigro had relatively, or at least were asking questions on a similar topic. So Paul uh, sort of suggests that perhaps a stiffer knee has a higher rate of loading and then less stiff knees may have a higher max load with greater knee flexion and muscle forces. Um, can this be, what, what do you, you know, how do you take from, from that? Um, and sort of related, um, is it increase in stiffness that you see due to an increased moment or, and or a decreased excursion? Yeah, so, I'll, um, so yeah, I think um, those are both really good questions. Uh, I definitely think um, potentially some of these changes, at least in the early stance phase, as the knee is accepting load, um, potentially an increased knee quasi stiffness um, might influence some of these, these loading rates. Um, I think going forward, that's something that we want to look at and how these individuals, if they are walking with stiffer knee, is that influence in the rate at which the joint is loaded. Um, we know that higher loading rates and cartilage is, is not a good thing and could influence degeneration. Um, in regards to our, our findings in early stance phase, um, we didn't find differences in the moment. So the peak knee extension moment in early stance was similar between limbs and there's a substantial reduction in the knee flexion range of motion. So I think at least in early stance phase, um, this is probably being driven by this reduction in the knee flexion excursion. Um, in mid stance phases, there's a sustained moment in the saddle plane as well as changes in the, in the extension range of motion. So I think in mid stance phase, this is probably influenced by both of those factors. Whereas in early stance, it's probably primarily driven by this uh, reduced range of motion. Cool, thanks. Um, and just a note to all speakers, since we probably won't make it through all of these questions, um, feel free to um, look through the chat, save the chat, uh, answer questions in the chat, or go to the spatial chat afterwards. Um, uh, there are quite a few coming in. Um, I'm going to uh, move to our first speaker, Virju. And um, as a quick question, um, before I ask a, a slightly less quick question, I may have missed, uh, this is from me, I may have missed this, but how did you measure um, kinesiophobia? So we measure kinesiophobia using the Tampa scale of kinesiophobia. Um, it's just a self-reported measure that asks 17 questions related to pain-related beliefs and kind of activity avoidance. Okay, and then related, uh, Natalia Sanchez asks if there's a seasonal difference, if you know if there's a seasonal difference in kinesiophobia, for example, do these measures change um, in winter versus uh, summer, especially, I suppose, in Chicago, where you have uh, ice and snow around. So we haven't actually looked at that, um, and I don't think I've seen anyone who has. It would be something interesting to look at. Um, kinesiophobia isn't something that really measures specific activities, but it would be interesting to see if maybe during the winter, if someone took that, they'd be thinking of more of winter tasks rather than like in the summer. But uh, that's a good question. It would be interesting to look at. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Or when they're tired versus not tired. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and then Mark, um, Kayla Prezier had a question on uh, why do you think individuals chose to increase stride length instead of increasing propulsion? And whether you think it has something perhaps due to the fixed speed nature of the treadmill um, uh, versus having a self, you know, an adaptive self-selected treadmill that may make it challenging to increase propulsion. So this is a question that honestly I've had, like I've thought a lot about and the reasons why um, there was no significant increase of propulsion. But uh, to answer some of the other questions first, I believe that in the Parkinson's disease population, it hasn't been highly correlated that uh, increased stride length and or walking speed and propulsive force have been correlated together. Um, and I also think it's going to be extremely interesting to see in the future whenever we are able to um, look at some of the time dependent variables related to the force like impulse to see if there is a significant difference there. Um, but ultimately, I think the reason why that they are increasing their stride length is uh, due to fatigue possibly, especially towards the end of the trial, as well as um, just even though they are at their self-selected speed, it still depends on an individual basis of if they are um, extending their stride or if they um, are increasing their double stance time as we also found too. Thanks, and then I have a quick follow-up because I was busy making sure I had uh, chat questions uh, copied over while you, were, while you were speaking. So you might have already spoke to this, but um, were your subjects still adapting by the end of that studied adaptation period or where, or did you, um, did they kind of plateau by that point? So by the, by the five minute uh, period, they were supposed to be plateauing just based on uh, previous research into the familiarization period. Um, and that was the main reason why we were looking between the first minute one and minute five um, of these individuals on the treadmill session. So uh, from what we saw, they were um, trying to plateau at the end, I believe, and uh, as well as into their other sessions. Uh, that's why this was the first exposure to the treadmill. And then we had other um, trials following. All right. I want to make sure I don't ask a question that you guys have already started answering in the chat. Um, so I believe I'm going to ask Billy a question now. This comes from Frankie Wade, and she's wondering whether increased uniformity in the uh, muscle tendon complex is why we see increased variability in older adults, and whether you think the endpoint change in walking is leading to these changes in the changes in morphology or vice versa. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I have no idea how to answer it real uh, succinctly, uh, but I would imagine that this is just a multi-part uh, complex where you could have changes from the tendon up and the muscle down that could impact walking performance, or perhaps these are um, results of walking performance. This could even be an energy conservation strategy where older adults are using one muscle over the other um, because of changes in protein biology. So it's, it's really, a, I don't have a great answer for you, but it's, it's probably involves a ton of different layers. Um, I'm gonna stay with you, Billy, because it seems as though some of the other questions I have for, uh, for Mark and Steven, they're answering in, in, the, in the chat. So um, on, sort of on a similar topic though, Paul DeVita asks whether a smaller muscle mass or number of total cross bridges in older muscle uh, might have any influence here um, more specifically, might the larger amount of motor unit remodeling and gastric demius with loss of fast switch unit uh, lead to more uniform tendon behavior in older adults? Yeah, that's a great question. So our results are consistent uh, with what we found during isolated contractions where older adults generated very similar moments to young adults, um, but still we saw these deficits at the tendon level and the muscle level. Um, but there is probably some influence of a muscle down effect where aging could affect, affect muscle contractile behavior and thus have a, a reduced force generation and that could impact uh, tendon non-uniformity. It's interesting, our results do suggest that the gastrocnemius in older adults is more affected than the soleus. The soleus behavior at the muscle and tendon level was uh, pretty unchanged, it was preserved, whereas muscle length change and tendon displacement uh, and muscle operating length of the gastrocnemius muscle subtendon unit seem to be more affected. So, um, yeah. 
Cool, and I think we have time for one more uh, question. And I know you've already answered this in the uh, chat, Stephen, but I'm going to ask you um, so you can tell the rest of the audience in case they're not reading uh, the question from Kristen Jabakowski. Uh, do you have any metrics on how much individuals trust their involved lag? Um, are individuals that are walking with increased stiffness uh, doing so as a means to increase joint stability, perhaps? Yeah, this is um, a really good question. Uh, I think it's very plausible that these individuals are using a stiffened strategy to kind of, you know, ensure that the joint is more stable. We know that these individuals are suffering from um, muscle weakness. And so some of these early changes could be, like I said, a quad avoidance gate or kind of a way to increase stiffness. It's kind of similar, similarly shown in those with OA. Um, we do have some self-reported measures um, that we collected at this time point that we haven't directly looked at, but this is definitely something that I can see contributing um, to the increased stiffness that we're seeing. Awesome, and thanks to all of our group two speakers, and um, I'm going to pass it over to James to lead us through our next block. Thank you. All right, we will continue with our next uh, presentation. will be from Kayla Pariser from the University of Delaware. Go Blue Hen. Uh, her title, the title of her talk will be Manipulating Adaptive Treadmill Control to Increase Propulsive Impulse. Okay. Following the trend, can you see it and hear me? Yep, everything's looking good. Perfect. Okay. So my name is Kayla, and I'm a PhD student in mechanical engineering at the University of Delaware, and I'm excited to talk about our work on manipulating adaptive treadmill control to increase propulsive impulse. Propulsive impulse, which accounts for both propulsive force and length of propulsive duration, is often impaired on the paretic side following a stroke. Because of the strong positive correlation between propulsion and walking speed, post-stroke gate training paradigms often work by targeting increased propulsion. Treadmill gate training is one common intervention post-stroke. Recently, researchers have begun to use adaptive, user-driven, or self-paced treadmills, since these may allow for stride-to-stride -stride variability, it's important for retention of learned behaviors, and to mimic overground walking more closely than a fixed-speed treadmill. However, to be most effective, these controllers should be designed to target increased propulsion. Our lab developed a novel adaptive treadmill that adjusts belt speed based on real-time changes in user bilateral step length, bilateral propulsive impulse, and center of mass position relative to the treadmill center. Each of these terms are weighted and the coefficients alpha, gamma, and beta dictate the importance of step length, propulsive impulse, and center of mass position respectively on determining the overall belt speed. We have learned that compared to fixed speed treadmill gait, healthy young adults generate larger peak propulsive forces and choose faster self-selected walking speeds with this adaptive treadmill controller compared to fixed speed treadmills, suggesting that it might be a good gait training tool. However, we've also found that on average, individuals post-stroke do not increase their propulsive forces for either limb on the adaptive treadmill compared to the fixed speed treadmill. So in this study, we wanted to see if we could promote increased propulsion with this adaptive treadmill simply by adjusting the relative importance of the propulsive impulse compared to step length in the adaptive treadmill control function. We accomplished this by changing the ratio of gamma to alpha. The results you'll see today were from an initial study to determine if these changes could increase measures of propulsion and we tested 22 young healthy adults. All subjects walked on each of the four adaptive treadmill control conditions shown in the table. And we asked the question, how does increasing the ratio of gamma, the coefficient on the propulsive impulse term, to alpha, the coefficient on the step length term, affect user propulsion and walking speed? So here's our results. This is a group bar plot where the first group depicts propulsive or anterior ground reaction force impulse across the four different adaptive treadmill conditions. The next group is braking or posterior ground reaction force impulse. And the final is net impulse or the sum of the two. From left to right in each group, the adaptive treadmill control condition is an increasing order of the ratio of gamma to alpha. Each bar represents group average plus or minus one standard deviation. So we found that propulsive impulse significantly increased from the equal to the high condition, while braking and net impulse remained similar across all four conditions. Additionally, in terms of walking speed, 
there were not any significant differences between the different conditions. This table shows the average and standard deviation for the group for the walking speed, self-selected walking speed for each of the different conditions. So at this point, you're probably asking, if you walk on the same physical treadmill, how is it possible that individuals can increase a measure of propulsion and not their speed? Well, increasing the ratio of propulsive impulse gain to step length gain essentially alters the treadmill training environment by providing a controlled amount of resistance to increases in propulsive forces as represented by the blue arrows. The change in environment might be analogous to changes in walking surfaces, like walking on sand or foam, where you have to increase your propulsion to achieve the same walking speed as you would on asphalt. However, the resistance was not strong enough to significantly decrease self-selected walking speed. An adaptive treadmill combining inertial force-based control, gate parameter-based control, and position-based control can be modified to promote increased propulsive impulse while maintaining a consistent walking speed simply by modifying the ratio of the gains and the control function. Our results suggest that by targeting increased propulsive impulse, users will be able to train both propulsive force and length of propulsive duration, both variables that can be impaired on the paretic limb following a stroke. Future work will determine if increasing the ratio of alpha to gamma can promote increased step length versus the propulsive impulse selectively, improving the efficacy of the adaptive treadmill as a gait rehabilitation tool. As a quick final plug, if you wanna learn more about our adaptive treadmill, uh, please attend my co-author Caitlin's talk in the Locomotor Stability Podium session on Thursday. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. We'll continue with our next presentation now from Sarah Brinkerhoff from Auburn University. Uh, and her presentation will be titled Weekly Exercise Amount Affects Gait Adaptation in Healthy Young Adults. All right, thank you, James. So we know that, oh, pardon me. We know that exercise has many multi-system benefits, but we don't currently know if exercise affects how people can adjust their walking pattern to different environmental demands. And so the purpose of this study was to determine the effect of the recommended weekly amount of exercise on gait adaptation in healthy young adults. And here we're using a split belt treadmill as a probe for how exercise affects gait adaptation. So we used a self-report exercise survey to group people based on their weekly exercise over at least the last three months per the ACSM guidelines for adults. So we ended up with two groups of young adult participants, sedentary and active. We asked our participants to walk on a split belt treadmill for 10 minutes at a two to one belt speed ratio. And while they did that, we measured their step length asymmetry, the asymmetry between their fast and slow moving legs um, and normalized step length asymmetry. And we looked at this measure because it's been the main focus in the literature to study how people adapt their gait on a split belt treadmill. And to analyze uh, step length asymmetry, we used mixed effects nonlinear modeling. Now this nonlinear equation has three terms. The first term is some estimated plateau if people were to walk with their steps going to infinity, given the data in 10 minutes of walking. The second term accounts for the initial fast adaptation of step length asymmetry. And the third term is a, another exponential term that accounts for the more gradual, slower adaptation in step length asymmetry. And in this study, we're asking are any of the variables in this equation affected by whether somebody is sedentary or active? And since we're modeling the data on a stride-by-stride -stride basis, we used mixed effects models to also account for the individual differences in the plateau. So in step length asymmetry, oh, let me get my pointer. In step length asymmetry, we see that active young adults initially adapt quicker than sedentary young adults and they adapt they more slowly decrease step length asymmetry after that. So the main differences are in the growth rates of the two exponentials, where we see that active young adults reach that elbow in their adaptation earlier than sedentary young adults do, showing they adapt the fast component quicker. And then after reaching their elbow, 
active young adults continue to adapt more gradually than sedentary young adults do. And previous research has shown that step length asymmetry is associated with the work generated by the legs during split belt treadmill walking. And so we also looked at the differences due to exercise in the work generated by the fast leg, which is uh, the leg that has the greater demands during split belt treadmill walking. And we use the same mixed effects nonlinear model to ask if exercise affects adaptation of the work generated by the fast leg. And we see a similar story. So active young adults more slowly and more gradually continually decrease positive work rate of the fast leg while sedentary do not. And the main difference there is after the fast component, after reaching their elbow, active young adults continually decrease their step length asymmetry. So recent work by Sita Pathy et al. used a theoretical model to determine that the initial step length asymmetry adaptation is done to optimize balance, while the more gradual slow component is done to optimize um, energetic efficiency or energetic cost. And in light of those findings, that leads us to interpret our findings as if young adults, active young adults are more quickly adapting their balance more quickly than sedentary, and active young adults are more slowly adapting their energetics as evidenced by the more gradual adaptation of step length asymmetry and positive work rate. So we saw that consistent exercise is important for quick initial step adaptation, and it drives people to continue to adapt their gait to meet their environmental demands. And some future directions for this work would be to observe the effect of exercise on longer than 10 minutes of gait adaptation, and then also explore the impact of exercise history on gait adaptation. So we looked in at least the last three months, what was someone's weekly exercise, but at what point does exercise start to affect gait adaptation? And with that, I'll say thank you. Um, and I'm going to put a plug for my lab mates. Um, if you want to see more about our sedentary and active participants, be sure to check out their posters tomorrow afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next presenter will be Daniel Kuman from the University of Alabama at Birmingham uh, with a talk titled The Effects of Sensory Disruptions on Rates of Locomotor Adaptation. Has everyone seen uh, the presentation? Yep, looks good. Okay, uh, thank you for that introduction. I'm also gonna be talking about locomotor adaptation using split belt treadmill walking. Uh, I'm not sure I need to go into too much detail about why adaptability is important, but it is a crucial feature of the locomotor system. Uh, we need to be able to adapt gate mechanics in response to changes in our environment, uh, including uh, internal and external changes, so things like obstacles, uneven terrain, uh, altered lighting conditions, but also in response to changes uh, in the internal environment, things like injury. I'm sure you've been walking and maybe rolled an ankle or something and had to adapt your gait mechanics quickly to that. Uh, and then loss of feedback, such as loss of vision or peripheral neuropathy or an inability to integrate feedback, um, changes that happen more centrally. So we need to be able to adapt uh, in order to accommodate these changes. Therefore, it's an important component of mobility. Uh, we need to understand the neural underpinnings of this adaptation, things like sensory motor integration, uh, because we know that with certain neurological disorders like Parkinson's disease, uh, sensory motor integration and other neural processes are impaired. And so we wanted to know whether or not we could probe the health of these processes as they relate to locomotor adaptation in a laboratory setting. In order to do that, we used a split belt treadmill walk, walking protocol. Uh, we had individuals walk for two minutes with both belts of a dual belt treadmill going at the same speed. And then at the two minute mark, they split. One sped up, the other slowed down, and they stayed like that for five minutes. And then uh, we had a retie period of one minute after five minutes of split belt walking. We had uh, individuals do this. These were uh, young, healthy adults, 13 of them. Uh, we had them do this five different times. We had them complete two trials where they were just up on the treadmill normally. Uh, no one held on to handrails. They were just completing the task uh, completely on their own. And then after the second normal one, they either uh, split one way or the other um, into our sensory manipulated trials. 
So we had two sensory manipulated trials, one where individuals wore glasses or goggles that um, restricted vision. And the other one was a 30% body weight support um, condition. The body weight support condition was meant to uh, manipulate proprioceptive feedback and the goggles obviously meant to um, uh, manipulate visual feedback. And then at the end, they completed another normal trial. The reason we include three normal trials is to account for trial to trial learning. This is what the uh, goggles looked like. Um, this was very difficult for people to perform, especially without holding on to handrails, uh, but we got through it. And then 30% 30, 30 body weight support was uh, provided using an overhead harness uh, located directly above the treadmill. That harness is on a rail, so it can move fore aft uh, without any problems. Individuals completed uh, the split belt walking trials and we quantified adaptation rate using a single exponential function. Uh, as a side note, Sarah, I, I posted kind of in the chat a question about the quality of the fits using your, um, your double expon exponential. So I'd be interested in hearing about that because we, we attempted to do the same thing, um, but that's for later discussion, I suppose. So we used a single exponential. And then for those familiar with this kind of data, if you're looking at our y-axis and thinking those are crazy numbers, it's because we z-score the data, uh, we do this to make sure that we're accounting for differences in individual uh, baseline means and standard deviations. So we first compared all three normal trials. Um, interestingly enough, we didn't find any statistically significant differences in adaptation rates, at least when we use the time constant of a single exponential function. Uh, but you can see as individuals complete more trials, um, it does look like their adaptation rate uh, actually slows down, which might be counterintuitive. Uh, but what we think is that over time, individuals are just less disturbed um, by the initial introduction of the split belt. Now the crux of our experiment was uh, seeing whether or not these sensory disruptions or manipulations had any influence. We used the third normal trial just to be as conservative as possible um, in our analytic approach. And we also, uh, although we see some slight differences in group level means, found no significant differences uh, between our normal and sensory manipulated trials. So this, uh, this provides some basic understanding to, uh, of locomotor adaptation. Healthy young adults are able to maintain adaptation rates even in the face of sensory manipulations. Uh, we believe that this is because they've got uh, very healthy nervous systems. They're able to engage sensory motor integration. When you take away vision, they're able to reweight and rely more on proprioception and vice versa. Uh, but really the reason that we set up this experiment was to see whether or not we could um, just do it. And then we think that there's some clinical utility. So if you have an individual, for example, with Parkinson's disease that does have disrupted sensory motor integration, we think that you could show disproportionate influences of, um, of sensory manipulations on their ability to adapt. And we think that that might provide us a good measure of the overall health of their nervous system. And so with that, I'll just say um, thank you to my co-authors and I look forward to hearing any questions. Thanks. Thank you. And our last presenter for this block will be Sydney Baden Bissell from the University of Florida uh, discussing the effects of propulsive force biofeedback on overground walking and those with Parkinson's disease. You nailed the last name. Great job. Um, can everybody see my screen okay? Yeah, cool. So good. Um, thanks for everyone for sticking around to the very end of the session um, and for the four, one fourth of the session talking about Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease at least once. So the project that I'm going to present is a part of a much larger research project like most of ours are, but if you're interested in hearing about um, the methods of the biofeedback itself, uh, I'll be presenting a little bit more of that at the podium sessions for disease and rehab on Friday at 11 a.m. So um, specifically when we're talking about Parkinson's disease and gait dysfunction in PD, the most uh, complained about symptom, most disabling symptom is their inability to um, ambulate around the community, take those long steps in order to walk well. Uh, unfortunately, while it's one of the most disabling symptoms, it's also the least likely to improve with any sort of treatment condition or um, treatment or intervention. Specifically, if we were to put a number on this, the average individual with Parkinson's disease walks 30% slower than an age-matched control, and that's across the disease spectrum. So it gets worse with disease progression. 
Um, and these kinematic changes, including shorter step length, are, also, are caused by lack of force production. Um, as even when we specifically account for differences in individuals, individual speeds, we see that uh, people with Parkinson's disease walk with 62% less push-off force than healthy older adults. Um, when, unfortunately, there are no standardized or specific interventions for individuals with Parkinson's disease due to the lack of understanding of the limiting factors that actually cause these mobility impairments. Uh, gait cueing and gait training um, can specifically draw attention to the distinct deficits and allow individuals to practice walking in a similar pattern to healthy older adults. Um, additionally, besides drawing attention to gait, um, treadmill training has become more popular and shows uh, potential benefits to walking as it acts as an external pacemaker that does not need to be regulated by the individual themselves. While biofeedback of propulsal force has been successfully used in uh, individuals with stroke and healthy older adults, to my knowledge, no one has employed um, biofeedback of propulsive force in this specific population. Therefore, our general purpose was to determine if overground walking speed and stride length can improve following an acute bout of biofeedback training. To investigate this purpose, we um, enrolled 10 individuals with Parkinson's disease to complete this single day study. Uh, first, all participants come to the lab. They do um, habitual overground walking at their comfortable selected speed. They then choose a treadmill speed that they deem is um, comfortable for the duration of the trial. And I have them walk at that for five minutes. Uh, following the baseline treadmill trial, they are split into two groups randomly, um, either a feedback group or a control group. The feedback group receives individualized biofeedback of their peak anterior posterior ground reaction force, where the force target was displayed as a red line transecting the screen at 140% of their baseline values. Specifically, individuals were instructed to push off harder at the end of every step to move a blue dot closer to the red line. Um, this was compared to a uh, contact control group, so to speak, where individuals were provided no instructions, were given no biofeedback or feedback otherwise, but just instructed to walk for the same amount of time that the other group received feedback. Um, collectively, the changes of an intervention like this uh, could be due to the instructions themselves and directing your attention to the instructions. It could be due to the treadmill, or it could be due to the bi biofeedback itself and or a combination of all three factors. So we specifically designed the experiment to have them at the end of the protocols uh, do a seated rest group. And then both groups were instructed with the same instructions to push off harder with every step. So the feedback group um, is basically re-practicing what they've already been practicing and the control group is given the same instructions that the feedback group's already been given. Uh, and then at the very end of the trial, we asked them to do their preferred overground walking speed over the ground just to see how it's changed. For this specific study, we're looking at the changes between baseline treadmill walking as compared to the instructed treadmill bit, as well as their habitual overground walking before and after the protocol. Uh, for the effect of the instructed treadmill walking, we do see both groups increase propulsive force when I ask them to push off harder but there is not a statistical difference between the biofeedback group in blue and the control group in orange. Um, we ran non-parametric Mann-Whitney U tests because we have such a small sample size. Uh, like, both of their stride lengths do increase, um, but not statistically different between groups. Where we see some interesting data is when we look over to the habitual overground differences we see that there is a statistical difference between the control group and the feedback group where the feedback group actually improves their habitual, preferred, comfortable walking speed and they do so by increasing their step length. While both groups increase propulsive force with instruction, the protocol group appeared to better capitalize on the larger forces that they practice. Um, and importantly, 
Uh, this red line represents the minimally imp clinically important difference for walking speed in individuals with Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, the feedback group was the group that was able to actually increase over this minimally cl clinically significant difference, um, while the control group was unable to do so on average. So in conclusion, this is just a very general pilot statement where we um, were able to collect some of this before the pandemic and we're opening up our research pool before we probably get shut down again, which we all as human researchers understand the struggles of this, but obviously would like to, um, I'm supported by a training grant, um, a Parkinson's Foundation grant, would help, which helped me learn with Dr. Jason Franz and the ASB grant and aid. Thank you. All right, so we will get into the questions for this block. I do wanna quickly note that um, if we don't get to your question, there is a spatial chat room for people to continue the conversation after the session, um, and that's spatial chat room two or the Mary room. Um, I will also note that there are several student and postdoc events happening directly after this. So if you can't find a speaker, they may be at one of those events. So maybe just send them a note um, and try to connect a bit later in spatial chat. Um, all right, we'll start with Kayla. Uh, Sydney asked, how difficult is it to use this algorithm, um, even if it's just anecdotally considering that some algorithms are tricky to figure out and feel comfortable on? Yeah, that's a great question uh, on some results that I didn't have time to show in the five minute presentation. Um, so we actually did a survey between each of the different uh, trials for each of the different participants. We asked them overall comfort level, uh, perceived stability, ease of achieving their desired speed and maintaining their desired speed. Um, and overall comfort and perceived stability, there was no significant difference between any of the conditions. Um, but achieving and maintaining their desired speed was significantly more challenging at uh, the greatest gamma to alpha ratio. Um, but once they kind of got there, they were able to keep it we stopped any trial that went deviated out of a plus or minus 0.2 meter per second range. So they were all able to achieve a pretty steady state walking speed. Thank you. Um, we will move to Sarah. Um, Megan Tony Bulger asks, why do you think that activity accelerates balance adaptation? Is it an exposure thing or strength thing or maybe something else? Yeah, that is that's a great question. Um, so, so gate adaptation is is a form of reinforcement learning um, where participants are like hypothesis testing in their environment to figure out what is the optimal strategy. In this case, optimizing balance, and it does make sense that that more exposure to movement, at least in the last three months in our sample. Um, people with more exposure to moving through the environment might be more efficient at finding that optimal strategy. Um, but I would also say strength may be a part of that. Um, and this, this study was definitely a first step in exploring how exercise could affect gait adaptation. And it, it definitely warrants a deeper dive into what about exercise is affecting how people might be optimizing their balance or their energetic cost. Um, I mean, is it balance confidence, aerobic capacity, strength, coordination, proprioception? Um, yeah, that's that is a great question, um, and I don't know if I answered it totally, but uh, I think I think a deeper dive and replication into this um, will help us find that answer. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Uh, Peter Scholl asked, "Have you explored haptic and or audio feedback? How do you think this would compare with visual feedback from your study?" Yeah, that's a good question. We had kicked around the, the idea of. Um, of trying a few other things like audio, like we actually kicked around the idea of having people just wear noise canceling headphones for the whole thing, uh, but decided ultimately not to do it. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if it, if it would influence it too much with healthy young people. Uh, but the, the visual feedback condition was very challenging for people. And we ultimately didn't see a, a significant difference between that and just normal. Uh, one issue is that the way that we modeled uh, adaptation with a single exponential didn't provide um, a very great fit. 
that's kind of why I was asking that question earlier. Um, cause we tried, we tried double single, we tried all sorts of fitting, uh, methods and just couldn't get a great fit, especially on the visual feedback trial, because the data was just all over the place. Um, but yeah, to answer the question more directly, I, I'm not sure it would influence adaptation too much, especially if the visual trial didn't, because that was, that was quite a disruption. People had a hard time completing that. Thanks. Um, Sydney, we'll move on to you. Um, if the two groups were matched for symptom severity, uh, or were the two gr groups matched for symptom severity, and have you also looked at improvements other than gait, such as postural instability during the feedback walking? Yeah, so um, we are getting uh, UPDRS3 scores, which are basically motor symptom scores, and we're having them scored by a physician. So while we didn't match them beforehand, uh, we are trying to consider that in the analysis. So we'll have that data at a later time. And then as for secondary measures, we um, in the abstract that I'm presenting on Friday, we look more at the what's happening within the actual biofeedback trials. And we're excited to look more in detail um, within those intervals in the future. Hard to present in five minutes at a time. Thank you. Uh, I think we are just about at the end here. I don't know if, let's see, any of these other questions can be answered in 20 seconds. Um, Kayla, what do you think is the main reasons for the high variance um, in the gamma alpha impulse data? Yeah, so I think a lot of that has to do with the, it, the increased resistance and it being more challenging to achieve and maintain their speed. Everyone was able to get to their desired speed and maintain it. Um, but I think because of that increased resistance, there was more variation in how people did that, which led to the variation in the group data. Thank you. Uh, so I think that brings us to the end of our, our question session here for this block. Um, Jessica, I don't know if you had anything that you were gonna plug before wrapping up here. No, just thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to our audience. And for those of you that are interested in CAN, head to the spatial chat. I think we might post it one more time in the chat. Um, and uh, enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>